So Noah Harpster and Micah Fitzerman Blue, uh, the screenwriters of A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, this wonderful new film that's about Mr. Rogers, but about so much more. And so I've got to start with where it started. How did you guys come up with this idea of making this really unusual biopic? Yeah, I mean, we've been, we've been working on this for almost 10 years. Uh, and it, it started when I had a toddler, a very stubborn toddler, who, um, who wouldn't listen to a word I said. And <laughs> sort of in a moment of desperation, I, I put on a clip of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood on my computer and she turned and she started listening to him in a way that she has never listened to me uh, before or since. Um, and I, I said to Micah, I think, uh, we, I think I said, we, there, there's this warlock out there who speaks toddler and, uh, <laughs> and I think we need to write about him. It's true. Uh, and then, you know, so we dug in, uh, started doing research about him and I think realized pretty quickly that Fred Rogers is not like an ideal subject for a traditional biopic. Uh, he was unwaveringly awesome uh, and consistent for 73 years. Uh, so we started looking next to Fred, people around uh, Fred's world that he had affected uh, and you know changed their lives. And that, that's what sort of led us to the movie as it is now. And then, so it's, it's about his relationship with a journalist who's, I guess, inspired by Tom Juno. Like, how do, where, where, how do Lloyd Vogel and Tom Juno sort of intersect? Well, uh, so we had read Tom Juno's, uh, like, really wonderful profile of Fred Rogers in Esquire magazine. Uh, it came out in 1998. And in the course of our research, we read it because it's just, it's a, just a wonderful piece of writing. And we were looking for... Um, a source of inspiration, a way to tell a story about Fred Rogers, where Fred Rogers um, wasn't necessarily the the lead, um, because what we loved about Fred Rogers' story was that he was a you know he was an ordained Presbyterian minister. He was compulsively intimate. Uh, he was someone who, if you met him in the course of his day, would ask you know how you're doing, and he actually really meant it. Um, so there were countless stories of people whose lives were changed by Fred Rogers. And we found ourselves in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, um, in the Fred Rogers uh, archive. And we're looking uh, through all these stories. Fred wrote hundreds of letters. He prayed for people by name, uh, you know, every single day. Uh, and we looked up and we saw a box called Tom Juno. <laughs> and we said, can we see that box? And we opened this box, and there were uh, a couple hundred letters that Tom and Fred had exchanged, and not in the lead up to the profile. It wasn't, it wasn't research that Tom was doing on Fred. It was a friendship that endured for five years until Fred died in 2003. So uh, when that happened, when that, when that all kind of clicked together, that was the nucleus of the movie. And then we invited Tom out to L.A. We uh, interrogated him in a room, uh, like a like a windowless room with like a naked light bulb for uh, for like three days, and asked him everything. And then we um, and, and a lot of stuff came up um, about Tom and his family and his parents and his relationships. And then we we went away and we wrote a screenplay. Um, and we did the things that you have to do when you're writing a screenplay, which sometimes mean you're taking a whole life and you're condensing it into an hour and a half. And when, when Tom first read that draft, he, he felt like we were getting uh, um, all the big things right, uh, but that some pieces were, that were very personal for him, we had changed um, and we had done so uh, for creative reasons. And he felt like it was better for him to have his name uh, changed. So we changed the name of the character. Cut to, we're on set. Matthew Reese, the incredible Welsh actor, is meeting Tom Juneau, who's visiting us on set. And uh, you can see uh, Matthew kind of scan Tom uh, uh, and then uh, uh, make, make himself into Tom. Uh, and then uh, when Tom Juno ended up seeing the movie, um, the final screening, um, you know, and, he, and he's, he's written about this, uh, he, he felt like he, there was more of him than he ever thought he had ever revealed to us. 
Um, and so the movie does feel true uh, to Tom, the person. Um, but I think the, the higher order obligation that we had was to make it feel true to the spirit of the kinds of friendships that Fred had in real life for so many years. Well, what I, I love about the, the, the evolution of the film and how things sort of happen at the right time is you're sort of working on Transparent, and that's I, I, where you, Marielle Heller sort of presents herself to you and sort of, you, you guys are enthusiastic about this and you're talking to her. And so tell us about that conversation and how she came on board. Well, I think, you know, we met her, yeah, uh, years, years ago on season two of Transparent. And uh, we're talking about the movie. And I remember her saying in our office, she said, that sounds amazing. Why am I not directing your movie? <laughs> and we're like, oh, uh, uh, uh. and then uh, years later, she was directing our movie. So uh, we thought of her when, when other directors fell off. And, and uh, she was such an amazing addition. And she said to us, actually, she's like, who, who, would, uh, who have you always thought of? to play Fred Rogers. And we sort of, you know, bashfully were like, well, Tom Hanks, but you know, he kind of already said no. And, and, you know, let's, let's be realistic. And she cut us off and was like, Hey, like one second, let's like, let's give this a shot. Give me a shot. Let me go after him. Let me see if I can get him. Or like, yeah, okay. You can, we'll, we'll give you a shot to get Tom Hanks in our movie. And then she got Tom Hanks in our movie. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, right, you got a bit, he, and he, what I think appealed to him about the script was that it isn't the sort of the paint by numbers, the biopic, that it's, that he's this catalyst, Fred Rogers, for this mm -hmm. other really heartwarming story. And I think it's so um, unusual and why it's resonating. It's sort of this story about a man's emotions. Um, and I think we, we, no one I'd spoken about Toronto and that, uh, premier in the Thompson Hall in Toronto. We, you know, I'm Canadian. We don't know Mr. Rogers up there the way that American audiences do. But the fact that it resonated with this Canadian audience must really be so heartwarming for you that it is that he is sort of universal and it does. You don't need to know him to understand the message of the movie. Yeah, I mean, uh, my my wife uh, after that. Uh, that screening, our premiere at Toronto was like, you guys made a movie about kindness and empathy. And for whatever reason, it felt kind of punk rock. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's the world that we live in right now where there is, there is so much cynicism and there's so much darkness. And I think there, there seems to be an interest in people taking some time, seeing it with their loved ones and, uh, and, and getting to think um, about these things, about, about these core relationships um, in their lives. You know, I, I, had a, I had a good friend who went to that screening at Toronto also, and he's a, he's a new dad of a, of a brand new baby, and um, the baby is about six months, and he hasn't spoken to his own father since the baby was born, uh, which has been incredibly painful for him. And... Um, I didn't know that he had sort of scalped the ticket to the premiere and I saw him in Toronto the next day and he said, I saw your movie. And I said, Oh my gosh, what do you think? And he said, uh, I called my dad today. That's my review. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's incredible to, 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 that a film can do that. And I think that's, I know you work in television, but I think that the film of that, experience of an audience seeing the film together you know there is that kind of the collective experience um so you two you're writing partners I, i'm so interested in your the process of how you write i mean we see in television or film we see the way writers are i mean what uh i know noah you've sort of characterized it i think that you're the you're the heart and Micah's the brains. I mean, his <laughs> that was a, that's a gross uh, oversimplification. But I think that like, um, uh, I think I said, yeah, I said that. Uh, it's very Wizard of Oz. Or Wizard of Oz. Well, um, I wondered who had the, so which, and between you, you have the courage to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think like when we met, we've been writing together for 13 years. Um, and I think when we met, uh, we, we sort of bonded, uh, on a familiar, like a, a similar taste. Like we like the same movies, we like the same music, we like the same books, uh, and we have the same values. Like we, we, we kind of work the same, our families are very important to us. Um, and that 
that became like a major part of our of our collaboration. And I think as but we but we did have very different skills. And I think over the years, our skills have sort of grown closer together. Um, but I think we still we still thrive on this like common love of certain movies and books and music. Um, and, you know, that we allow each other to have lives outside of work that we that we keep, essentially keep bankers hours. And and um, and that's important to us. I mean, I was going to say. Like, you talk to a lot of people in our industry and uh and you know we're not we're not fighting forest fires but it's hard and it can be lonely and it can be confusing and alienating and you get a lot of rejection and you get a lot of sort of confusing messages all the time and i think for us the partnership is so important because it's sort of like you know you, you go to a notes meeting at a studio and it's sort of like going to the doctor where the doctor will tell you something and uh, and they can be like, uh, you, actually, you're really sick. And sometimes you don't want to hear that. So I'm always the person who's like, I think we're fine. I think they love what we had to say. And Noah, you know, like we're, we're, he, Noah's like, yeah, uh, that's not what happened at all. Uh, they didn't like anything we said. And we have a ton of work to do right now. He fell asleep in the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so... So speaking of that, I, I, that first table read, the first time you, you know, the, the script as it then was for Beautiful Day, and I know that you took a lot away from that. Um, so that, pro I mean, how painful is that process? Something you've worked on for so long, and you you obviously think it's ready for people to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, this was, you know, this was, I think, eight years ago when that happened, and it was our friends. And I think that's been a, a large part of our success is that we have a community of people who will tell us the truth, uh, you know, when we need to hear it and, you know, in a loving way. And I think that like coming off of that table read, it was like a lot of this is working, but a lot of this isn't. And, uh, and I think that's been a large part of our, of our success is that like we believe in the power of like a collaborative sort of cultural writer's room of people who who are there and are sort of your trusted confidants. And I know then when the script, when you finally get the studio funding, I mean, where did Mrs. Rogers come in? When did you have to get her? Joanne a Rogers, yeah. 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 I mean, the uh, Joanne Rogers is an amazing human being. Um, and uh, we, you know, we began working on this movie uh, after Fred uh, had died. So, Joanne was the closest person um, uh, to him who we spent time with, and uh, it wasn't easy getting to her. Um, there are uh, there are people who are sort of the gatekeepers, the keepers of the of the flame of Fred Rogers. There's one, Bill. One I mean, well, Bill, Bill Eisler, Eisler is uh, he's the person who uh, we put as a character in the movie, played by Enrico Calantoni. But uh, he's uh, he's the person who. Uh, read the first draft of the script. We sent it to him, and he, we, we, we sort of invited ourselves to Pittsburgh to meet with him. And he said, "Hey, you guys seem really nice. I just want you to know, there will never ever be a Fred Rogers movie. But go ahead, <laughs> we can talk now." And uh, it took us a couple years for him to to sort of have the the trust and the faith in us. Uh, to be able to to sort of make this movie, um, because the first draft we wrote, we had no rights. Um, we all, all all we had, you know, we had uh, we had producers, we had directors, um, but we didn't have the ability to actually make this movie. And this movie is the kind of movie that needs the music, it needs the character of Fred Rogers, and it needs the blessing, and and and, and it needs the spirit of yeah. collaboration with the Fred Rogers company, and cool. and so. Yeah. Eventually, we got to meet Joanne, and Joanne told she basically, you know, she sat with us for a couple hours, uh, our first meeting, and she said, "I have one thing that really matters to me, which is that you not portray my husband as a saint, but as a real human being, and and for and and because if you make him a saint, then what he does seems unattainable. It means that you can't do it, but it was a practice." 
And it actually is possible for you to live your life, maybe not like Mr. Rogers, but close to it. Well, I think what's extraordinary is I, ha I have to believe there were much more seasoned teams, uh, studios, various people had pitched her, I'm sure, before you two. And really, the, at that point, very sort of new to the industry. And you win her over, I think, by capturing the heart of the man, but making this really compelling story. Um, I, I know that she was so taken with you, and they all were. Didn't they let you sort of use original puppets, the original studio, the cameras? I mean, there's such an authenticity. Yeah, they opened up everything to us. Um, um, we did. We shot on WQED Studios, um, and they shot on the original cameras, which I think they tracked down in London or something. They flew them in from England. These big pedestal cameras uh, that have the, you know, the smaller aspect ratio. And, you know, the big thing that they did, and Micah mentioned it earlier, is that uh, Bill and Joanne, you know, opened up Fred's archive to us, uh, which is in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which is, you know, all of those things, the puppets, all of the sort of artifacts of the show, but also all of the correspondence that Fred had, you know, with hundreds, maybe thousands of people, um, of these letters that he wrote, uh, uh, these emails that he sent every day. They've all been sort of categorized uh, and filed away. And so we put on white gloves and, and we're able to go through all of them. A lot of the speeches he gave, we were able to, to sort of see his notes. Um, is it really kind of moving and, 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 um, pretty intense four days we spent there. And the movie is very like, it's handmade, right? That we, we, we did it the slow way. Uh, we, you know, we were shooting on these old cameras. We were building these puppets. We built these miniatures. Um, we were trying to recreate everything um, in the way that Fred created everything, right? He 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 made all he he made all these sets. He wrote all these songs. He wrote every single word. Everything was sort of made by hand, and we wanted the movie to have that same feeling. So I'm curious about when you make something, and sometimes you step back and look at it. Is there one element, one scene that you're just thrilled is in there, and then is there a, co a corollary? Is there a scene that you just, you know, with the studio and testing, is there a scene that you've had to take out that we will get as a DVD extra that you kind of, was? it was really tough to take out? I think the scene that's in there uh, is the minute of silence that, um, you know, Fred did at the daytime Emmys. He also did it at, uh, numerous times at uh, commencement speeches, stuff like that. And, and he did it, you know, personally with other people. And that's something that, you know, very early on, people were very suspicious of. Of putting in this movie um and because it's a minute yeah. of silence and it, you know and and fred rogers looks right down the barrel of the camera and looks right at you and that was always incredibly important to us um as part of the dna of the entire project that this is this yeah. is about you you are a participant in this movie if you're going to sit down you're going to watch a show a, an episode of mr rogers neighborhood about an adult um, and it's going to be just as much about you as it is him. And we thought that that was going to end up being an, ultimately a much bigger fight than it was. As soon as Marielle came on, she's like, oh, yeah, no, that's staying. <laughs> you know, that's staying. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's in the movie, and, and she, she nailed it. It's it, it, you know, Tom Hanks nailed it. It's like, you know, one of my favorite moments, um, certainly in the movie, but also to have imagined to be in the movie. Um, and I don't think there's anything that's really in the movie that they cut. I mean, there's tons of songs and things that Fred did that we hoped we could find a way to put in, but but really, like, just thematically didn't didn't match up. Or, like, um, Francois Clemens, when he washes his feet with Francois Clemens, is, like, one of our favorite moments. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of uh, the Senator Pastore trial in 1969 that's in the movie, but just a little bit. Um, there's a wonderful song called You Can Never Go Down the Drain, which is like perfectly weird and perfectly sweet um, that Fred wrote because he had heard that um, what a real fear of small children is that, you know, they will actually go down the drain of the bathtub. So he wrote this like amazing song called You'll Never Go Down the Drain. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's lots of little things we wanted to put in, but ultimately like, you know, the theme and the story wins. Yeah, I think, you know, for us, it's weird. Maybe the thing that we're most proud of as screenwriters in our entire career is a full minute with zero dialogue. 
Oh, but it's so, it's, as you said, so powerful. And it's the reason that the, the film's resonating. Well, listen, thank you for taking the time. I know you guys are super busy with lots of other projects. And uh, so thank you for taking time to talk to us. And uh, yeah, I'm so, I think, pleased that uh, to have been there for that premiere, to have witnessed that, the beginning of this, the journey, a decade long uh, in the making. And now you're sort of, you've got the finish line in sight. The film opens in a couple of weeks. So best of luck. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.